So hi, everyone. Um, I am Stephen Henry Madoff, the chair of the MA Curatorial Practice Program at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And um, tonight we're here, or I should say for Terry, um, today we're, we're here with Terry Smith. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Terry with us. And what we're doing is we're celebrating um, this book, which is the first book in a new series that um, I'm editing for Sternberg Press, simply called Thoughts on Curating. And um, Terry's is the inaugural volume. The next volume, which will be out in June, is by um, Zdenka Badinovich. So we're very excited about the series. And um, um, I think since we have a short period of time, I'm going to jump in. I'll just say a couple of things. First, that um, we are being recorded. So be aware of that. If, um, if you ask a question at some point, you will be recorded asking it. Um, and that's also to say that the last 10 minutes or so um, via chat, please enter any questions that you have. <clears throat> and we'll begin. So Terry, um, um, first, I should say, I'll, I'll just read um, from the back of the book. It's, a, it's quite long, so I won't read all of Terry's accomplishments, uh, which would probably take the entire hour that we have. But uh, Terry is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Contemporary Art History and Theory in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at the University of Pittsburgh and Professor in the Division of Philosophy, Art and Critical Thought at the European Graduate School. And I'm thrilled to also say that he's part of our program's faculty at large. So um, with that, um, let's just jump in, Terry. And why don't we begin? Um, if you can simply lay out what the complex, curating the complex, what the complex or more fully what you call the visual arts exhibitionary complex, abbreviated as VAEC, what it entails in terms of the fields of categorization you use to map the global art world. Okay, uh, share screen. Let me share my screen, if I may. So it's great to be here. Thanks, um, thanks very much, Stephen. It's also terrific to see uh, many people, including friends and uh, family, <laughs> I can see you on the on the side, and that's that's fantastic. Um, I should uh, every time we speak from Australia, we make it very clear where we're speaking from. Uh, we're speaking from the uh, place called Sydney, but actually, long before it was Sydney, it was part of the um, lands of the Gadigal people of the or. Aora Nation, who the indigenous people who still own the land that we uh, that we're on, it's unceded, and I acknowledge the elders, past, present, and uh, and emerging. Um, I'm speaking with uh, Stevens, and I have to thank a bunch of people very quickly for the book. First, Stephen, he not only because he invited me, but because he's also one of the great editors. He's very sort of astringent uh, editor. Um, and it really improved my writing a uh, huge amount. So I thank you, uh, Stephen. I've also um, trialed many of these ideas at curatorial studies programs in many places, including School of Visual Arts, um, many places all over the world, in, in Melbourne in particular, um, uh, also uh, students in Sydney and of course in Pittsburgh. Great to see some colleagues from Pittsburgh on the call as well, and ex-students I see also. Um, and current students, fantastic. So everybody has sort of fed into this, um, uh, to what I've been able to put together. So it's evolved over a while. And Stephen asked me to do the first, if you like, essay in the series. Um, and a primary, uh, primary readership is, of course, curatorial studies students and people interested in uh, curating in general. So this particular a book talks, in effect, builds on the two earlier books that I've done, Thinking Contemporary Curating, which would try to, um, as it were, picture or map the way in which I thought curators thought, 
how do curators think? And I was a little dismayed that curators were not at that point articulating their own theoretical structures as much as one might have wished. And so I decided to do it. <laughs> um, got a lot of really good feedback and that led to um, talking contemporary curating, sort of conversations with many different curators so that the curators could speak their own um, theory, if you like, uh, speak the theory of their practice. So there were two books by, from ICI, Independent Curators International, Kate Fowle and Renee Pro, and wonderful people there. Uh, this one is kind of adds to that. And what it does is kind of map the context, tries to map the context of contemporary curating. And that's um, what I'll do by, that's what the book looks like, if you've seen. And it really asks the question, how do, what connects, if you like, a place such as, as the Met, what connects the Met with Google can transform itself? What connects the Met to this extraordinary um, real estate development, uh, which uses um, visual, uh, the visual arts as its primary uh, selling point, uh, the high end of the visual arts? What connects those two things with um, uh, Ruin Grouper, for example? So what connects and what's different? What, what disconnects, what connects um, this incredible array, this world, um, which isn't a coherent world at all that we're, um, we're involved in. So what I did was do something really simple. Um, I just listed all the places where um, the uh, visual arts are exhibited. Just simply produced a list of them. Um, starting in the top left-hand corner, going down one side, continuing down the other side. So you've got this um, long list and I've tried it in, uh, I've talked about this many times and written many articles about it and get lots of commentary about it and people keep adding things to it. So this is a list, um, it is in the book. Uh, you can do a screenshot if you like, or this will be recorded so you can come back to it. So obviously you don't read everything. But essentially, if you put all the sites, the places, the venues, the physical venues or the actual virtual sites on which the visual arts are exhibited, you take the first step in mapping the, the domains of curatorial practice, the places where curators go, where they work, and they, you know, curators do, do their work. Um, it's totally bizarre that no one got around to doing that before, but it's a really simple thing. And immediately, one should do that. Um, various things start to become very obvious straight away. So I read this list in four different ways. Firstly, we read it historically, being an art historian, of course, one reads things historically. So the, it's really a list of, of, of modern um, uh, exhibitionary sites. Clearly prior to this, there are great private collections, uh, princely collections, papal collections, and so on and so forth. And there are also academies of artists, but in the, in the actual modern period, universal art history museums, as you see at the top, like the Met. And if you just work your way through you see the appearance, one building on the other, the appearance of new, uh, different ways of showing art, showing works of art of one kind rather than another, works of art from one period rather than another, works of art in one locality rather than another, works of art in relation to universities, then works of art that devote single museums and so on and so forth. So that whole cluster there is different kinds of museum or what we call in Australia gallery, um, public gallery, uh, and eventually private, uh, developed some recent years of much more private dimension or separated private dimension. So that evolves through time. Commercial, the whole um, commercial dealer system evolves, um, has various histories, but essentially starts to take off in the 18th, but more than 19th and late 19th century, developing to the incredible spread of art fairs we have at the moment. Biennials, um, Venice, of course, but really exploding in recent years. So there's a history there as well. 
the Kunsthallen go, of course, back to academies, but, um, but also the German Kunstverein, the Kunsthallen, the artists associations, all of those have evolved. Many, many more finer distinctions, more subtle ones have evolved until we get up to the present, uh, where we have multi-arts activist collectives, such as, you know, 16 Beaver in New York, or Ruin Grouper itself uh, is an example of that. And then, um, if we look from a different perspective, from the point of view of publics, from outside the, what we used to call the art world, or places where art is generated, places where art is, as it were, shown to the public, and sometimes even generated um, outside uh, the technical art worlds, there's a whole domain of those as well. And in recent years, they've taken on this other huge dimension uh, in terms of um, uh, social media and, and, and sites. So you can read this whole list historically, and it, it gives us the, the grounds of the development of, of art, the places where curators work, and we do a history of uh, each of these areas, or we can write histories of one museum or one art space or one public domain, one biennial, whatever, we could do it historically. Okay, second thing, so I don't go on for too long. <laughs> there are, this is a power structure. This is a structure of our cultural power. It all reads mostly top down. Uh, most of the wealth and the political and social power in any city, uh, and this is a very modern and therefore city oriented um, uh, operation that we're looking at here that becomes cosmopolitan as time goes on, but it's a city operated. So cultural power is, um, is concentrated uh, towards the top left-hand side of the diagram. It becomes ambivalent in the middle. There's not very much of it in the top right-hand side of the diagram, but pushing, pushing upwards and backwards, it's distributed on the bottom right-hand side of the diagram, different kinds of cultural power. Um, thirdly, the other aspect that's really interesting about this system, when you ask what animates, what makes it dynamic, there are, there are at least two ways in which it's animated. The first one is that every one of these um, places, every single um, kind of institution is animated by its own internal dynamic. Uh, every one of them is in fact not doing one kind of thing. It's usually got a double dynamic operating um, it's usually trying to do two kinds of things that are not exactly compatible, but work together and generate its in, in energy. For example, the most obvious case, every great public museum, or even smaller ones, if they have a collection and put on exhibitions, are operating in terms of the slow time of historical collecting and conservation, and the fast or shorter times of putting on exhibitions that prepare for the larger collection and so on. There are complex relationships between the collection rooms of a museum and the exhibition rooms of a museum, plus, of course, its other spaces, educational and uh, the bookshop and all the rest of it. Complex dynamics operating there. In fact, everywhere on this system, there's a double, di double dynamic. Um, artists often start an, uh, an artist's initiative to show the work of themselves and their friends. It, doesn't quite want to be a contemporary art space, but often it becomes one, then, then there's dynamics about that. Artists often have a conflict between their own practice and the collective practice. So there's an individual collective energy uh, dynamic that operates more on the right-hand side of the diagram uh, and so on and so forth. So everywhere you can find, even in uh, commercial galleries, where you have values that are basically fairly much exchange values, um, selling the work is a crucial thing, but also many dealers uh, act as uh, curators or innovative curators and things like that have values that are not entirely commercial, uh, although, and there can be attention dynamics between them. And so it continues all through. Biennials have um, a double dynamic, uh, well, many dynamics I've written about them and at some length. Um, but they're it's kind of temporary. Uh, they, have, they have a kind of temporary position between many of the other um, parts of the system and come back to that. So that's that kind of a dynamic. And finally, the last way you can read this is, in fact, this is a, a sort of network uh, which, in which every part 
has its eye on another part. For example, most contemporary art museums um, want to behave as if they're Kunsthallen, right? Uh, even though many of them actually have collections, they have ambiguous relationships to their collections. They want to behave as if they're an artist space. Um, sometimes artist spaces behave like as if they're a museum of contemporary art. So everyone, uh, all the museums of modern art have to worry about becoming historical. Uh, they desperately want to stay contemporary. The Museum of Modern Art is a classic sort of machine that just grinds the contemporary art of whatever goes into it and turns it into the sort of modernist sausage as, you know, as time goes along. So, um, you know, we, uh, I'm being, anyway, whatever. So there's, a, those are the four <laughs> ways I, I'd introduce this. And uh, they set up this framework and they create um, places where curators and particularly now in recent years, we've seen curators begin, if you like, as part of an artist collective, and then 30 years later, maybe they're running a museum um, or not, or maybe they're con staying in the area and don't want to make that kind of connection. But we've got this a very elaborate um, framework, which of course is very present in the old centers of imperial power and the dominant world centers at the moment. It operates as a kind of, um, uh, in some ways, as an ideal and a challenge and a, a desire in many other parts of the world, a desire, some ways, to create this critical mass in the hope that art will become much stronger in whatever place you're in. But it's not, uh, it's becoming obvious to many people around the world that trying to build this huge structure. Um, uh, is not necessarily <laughs> the right thing to do, but aspects of it might work in one's area. So there's a complex relationship between how all this operates, say, in New York or Sydney or St. Petersburg or Moscow, for example, uh, Berlin, where it's really, you know, or Tokyo, where you have over 500 actual art museums in one city alone. Um, that is very different in many other parts of the world. Okay, I'll stop there if I could, Steve. So I've just given a kind of big... Well, that's, uh, that's obviously a, a good start. Um, I mean, the, of course, the question is, how do they interrelate? You talked about the fact that um, the visual arts exhibitionary complex is not monolithic, that there are um, smaller, larger, versions of it uh, and that we're in a, a network situation, we're living in a network culture. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit more about the way that this interrelationship of networks through the VAECs happens. Okay, thanks. I've actually done a little bit of work on that diagram. And if you'll forgive another one, um, everybody, uh, this, um, this is a different way of looking at what I've just shown you, a way that kind of brings out, uh, enables me to visually answer um, uh, Stephen's uh, question, how do the parts relate? And um, so uh, forgive my crude marking, but what I've done is just literally cluster them um, kind of much more clearly than they appear when you look at a list. And when you do that, a couple of more things become really striking. Um, if you look at the two top clusters, um, and the I've just done a simple line between them, this to me is probably essential dynamic of the whole, uh, the whole system. This to me is, there's an incredible force on the top left-hand side within, let's call it the museum's complex. Uh, museums part of the complex because obviously conservation of collections serving a nation or a civilization um, serving a kind of history of modern art um, serving the core values of the university um, or one artist you know uh, showing one person's private collection there's a there's a kind of a, a core of the of the enterprise there, which wants to 
both gather, collect, and preserve, and and do that in a way that keeps the collection open and dynamic and growing. Right? So this is institutionalization, which in itself, per se, um, over time becomes entropic and slows down and holds things. But it's also something humans do and will always do and won't stop doing. Institutionalization is not a 100% bad thing. Uh, although it is, of just to said, entropic. It's something that will will be done. Humans will keep doing it, and uh, and so it has that that sort of energy. Whereas, if you look at what drives uh, uh, and what what the kind of energy that drives the other other side of the diagram, and the Kunsthalle and artists' associations, so sort of, all of these are driven much closer to the production of works of art um, and to the points of origin, uh, the energy of the origin, which is often uh, an energy that wants to join the traditional histories and practices of art, it wants to join those, but often also wants to critique those or oppose those or find a different way. So again, you've got this, that, that classic double energy, which we've had in various forms throughout the history of art. Um, sometimes, you know, it's about renovating a tradition, and sometimes it's about trying to, you know, blow up the museums and explode them. Um, it, many variations in between. But that's a dialectic between institutionalizing and deinstitutionalizing. You know, institutionalizing and deinstitutionalizing. So the basic system, um, to me, gets its energy of persistence and growth and con continuity from what it's most manifest in what museums do. And it gets its that energy of growth and innovation and so on, obviously from the practice of making art and art coming made by artists coming up, artists coming up that way. And the generation of exhibitions, um, which the book goes on to talk about in, in a lot of kind of detail, Exhibitions uh, are made by curators, obviously, and curators, as, as my friend Oak, we often say, curators look at works of art and bring them together in a way that generates a surplus value, a value that's implicit in the work that's been collected, but when it's been put together in an exhibition, it adds to that something other, another value, an exhibitionary value of another kind has been generated. Okay, we call surplus. Doesn't mean it's useless and unnecessary. It's absolutely essential for the system. That's the whole system is about producing that surplus. Um, and curators are the people who, uh, who as it were, lead in doing that. Um, curators are also the people who who move around the system and energize it most, actually activate this whole sort of ecology. One can use the word as he does, ecology, as a metaphor. It's not like a natural, it's not a natural system. It's only, we use it only as a metaphor, meaning a system uh, that has its coherences and incoherences and uh, its kind of energies that uh, keep repeating and then demanding variation and so on and so forth. So if you're going to, from that point of view, you've got this, you know, credible sort of, you know, ongoing sort of dialectic that never resolves itself um, at the top of the complex, uh, if you like. And then um, feeding into that, if you look at the lower left, obviously the energy of the commercial um, the art dealing system, necessary to keep uh, artists alive and, you know, uh, feed into museums and so on and so forth. Um, biennials have uh, evolved for many different purposes, um, but one of them is to uh, distribute the um, energies of new art um, around the world, to distribute it across the world, to bring it back and forward from, to one place from everywhere else, so uh, Bernils have this kind of provincialist structure built into them. Most of them 
at least they used to be outside the main cities. Now they're kind of everywhere, including in, in the suburbs. So um, biennials have distributed themselves back throughout the system. Um, but what they distribute is not an ongoing single uh, uh, institution located in one place, but an institution that repeats itself every two years, or at least every in time. So they, um, biennials are obviously, you know, temporal uh, institutions that, um, or quasi institutions, because they try and represent the energy that's in the Kunsthallers, uh, but they're often located in museums and galleries. Um, so they have that, uh, that kind of double, uh, uh, double position, and again, a double dynamic. They connect many of them with the commercial system, the much more, you know, the, this huge funding of biennials uh, out of the dealer system and, and so on and so forth. They also operate, and I should have done a, uh, I now see I should have done a, another little green line across to public because clearly biennials nowadays are great city events. They're very public art events. They're spread throughout the city. So I've just realized I should have done a, another diagram there. They, they make contemporary art um, public in ways um, that is often more spectacular than what, how it happens in museums and often in art spaces where work is made for a very small group of people because it's at an experimental stage. Anyway, so that's how I'm thinking at the moment about this um, system in a much more dynamic uh, kind of fashion. There you go. So I'm, I'm wondering about two different forms of <coughs> change. Um, one is, you know, as you've mentioned, you've talked about centers, peripheries. There's a network, of course, in every network, which is made up of hubs and nodes. There are those that are ramifying in different ways. And one form of energy is capital. Another form is cultural capital, as you've described it. Yeah. You know, having mapped all of this, and I think that's a huge value of, of the essay. Um, how do you see that, you know, as we look toward the future? Um, it seems right now that there hasn't been a change despite COVID in terms of inequity, in terms of the way that uh, capital is being aggregated by the few. Um, do you see a way for these VAC, VAECs <clears throat> to change in some way? Is it that the, the large centers will continue to be at one centers of creativity, but also narrowed and limited by genuflection to capital in a sense mm -hmm. that through the market narrows things and that therefore the real innovation will happen outside. So <clears throat> let me stop there before I ask about the next part. Um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? What do you, what do you see having mapped it in this way? Well, that's a, that's a huge question about, I mean, uh, okay. That in the in the essay, I actually quote a, a wonderful uh, essay by Vasif Korton from um, Salt uh, in Istanbul, the great curator for many years at Salt. And I just learned from you before, Stephen, that he's uh, stepped away from curating in Istanbul. I don't blame him, given the circumstances, to become a farmer. But not <laughs> and so Vasif, uh, I quote from an essay he wrote in 2018. Let me just read it for you, I think, because it relates to the question of capital. Right. Uh, he says, a core issue here is to underscore the notion of a museum situated as a non-capitalist institution embedded in a turbo-capitalist economy. Please note, that there's a difference between anti-capitalist and non-capitalist. The first is a political position, while the second is a public condition. It was not the only condition, uh, sorry, it was the only condition not to be surrendered by the social state or the welfare state. Okay, so he's identifying a non-capitalist position. Right? He's not saying give up being anti-capitalist, is not saying that, that would not be the right thing to say, but he's talking about something called, something which doesn't surrender to the time of, uh, the different times of the capitalism is 
who's requiring from us uh, by either a social state or a welfare state. He said, non-capitalism is about public time, which holds the society together and which turbo capitalism has helped to erode and decimate. The average lifespan of a private company is less than a century, about 75 years, but public time is supposed or expected to be more or less infinite. The museum is a three century old operation that makes it older than most countries' economic or political systems. Now, it's a bit wishful when you put it that general in such a general fashion, but he is making a really important point. And it's a point that I've felt strongly about for many years. It's a point that there are non-capitalist parts of our economies, non-capitalist parts of our lives, non-capitalist parts of the world, uh, in very diff many different parts of the world and non-capitalist operations, almost everything you're looking at in the diagram is at its core non-capitalist, at its core in its values and its absolute core activities. None of it actually needs capitalism to run. None of it actually shares the deep values of, um, uh, of capital, except of course, <laughs> The core business of exchanging money for a work of art in a uh, in a in a, uh, in a in a gold rig, but again, not every money exchange is capitalist. Right? If you look at the thing from a broad historical point of view, if you also realise, uh, as Ken Walker's pointed out, you know, capitalism may be is it dead or it's getting pretty close in real trouble. Now we may have got ourselves in the world in general into a worse situation than what capital provided that may be coming up. This is a larger political debate, which I'm happy to have. Um, but what I'm, I absolutely agree with Cortona about um, is that the fundamental energies that we're looking at here and that, that have driven art and continue, I hope will, will continue to drive art making uh, forever um, are, um, uh, practices and values and commitments and just ways of spending time um, that are absolutely subject to the to to capital. You know, every time an artist has to sit down and write a grant to survive, or you know, uh, all those things are occurring, uh, cursing public welfare. But the public welfare is there because the the capitalist system isn't supporting the practice of the artists and so on. So. There's all these steps involved. Uh, and so without, for a moment, pretending we're in any kind of wonderland, it's absolutely essential, I think, to um, highlight the fact that um, uh, we're looking here at a whole set of values and practices. Um, and we see them in, uh, that, will, uh, that will survive, cap you know, that are in fact outlasting capitalism, will survive them. We see that uh, not just in what I've listed here, and, but for example, in Australia, we're really very fortunate because we have a whole indigenous culture that's been here for at least 60,000 years. And those of us who, who come to learn something about it slowly realize that these people, these are people who have, have, capitalism has done everything it possibly could to them but they will outlast it. They will survive it. You know, you get a sense that there is a longer history, history you know, there's a deeper and longer history here that comes out of their culture, uh, but also out of their art. And their art makes that point for us in Australia again and again and again. Um, so there, you know, there, there are many ways in which one, um, uh, I'm thinking positively about the situation, even though I know that in the next, the coming years, not just because of uh, things like COVID <laughs> have been, will keep on being generated because of the inequities, the wealth inequities of the world. Um, COVID will, will uh, keep being produced um, because of wealth inequities and, and the failures of capital to become a universal system, uh, if you like. So point is a ways of answering your question there's no simple answer to it. Um, but it seems to me, you know, based on what you're saying that we, I'd like to argue a little bit with you 
first of all, you know, um, capital is, of course, at the heart of many of these activities, even though, you know, the core value of making things of creativity have it has nothing to do with capital but you know from even from your chart well biennials typically can't exist without capital but let's put that aside for one second to you know to say that um the kinds of structures that you've been laying out here are structures that don't seem to have changed um by what we're undergoing now which is COVID, and now you know in fact when Terry first um, wrote the essay, it was just pre-pandemic. And then we went back and we said, no, um, you know, you've let's see how what you've written <clears throat> is changed. But at this point, we're now entering a fourth wave. We now have Omicron on the horizon um, as being a, a fourth devastation. And in thinking about that, you know, I think that the, the VAEC hasn't been infected, really, fundamentally. These kinds of network structures that you've laid out mm. um, haven't changed. True enough, there are timed entries. True enough, um, there are certain things that have taken place about the flow of bodies within exhibitionary spaces. But it hasn't really changed. Um, the only change I would say is something that rose with the pandemic, which was Black Lives Matter in the US and the way <coughs> it's impacted the art world in terms of representation and collections representation to write social justice, to write racial imbalance. Um, and that's not a small thing, it's a major thing. But in terms of the big picture that you've laid out, I don't really see any kind of fundamental change. Do you? Um, in some ways, no. <laughs> Precisely to the point I've just made. This kind of structure, uh, which has evolved over centuries, um, and, and, and which is paralleled in many other uh, domains, you know, not just the making of art, um, it's in sports, for example, you know, you could look at similar structures. There are many other um, social fields, if you like, to use, you know, Bourdieu's terms in terms of fields uh, in which uh, various kinds of capital, uh, he called, he says every exchange in those fields is some kind of capital exchange. I don't accept that. Uh, I accept this idea of fields and that you could develop uh, similar fields um, uh, in other other parts of uh, human societies, but um, Stephen, the, what I'm <laughs> what we're dealing with here is human social continuities that pre-exist capitalism will exist beyond capitalism. Not all of these, and not all each one of these, are not in this form, but mm. some versions or another of this these kinds of connections. Um, will continue through, unless um, the you know the, the kinds of you know governmental implosion. Unless um, okay, very simple. Unless the greed to extract the world's resources and make huge amounts of money from them destroys the the absolute necessity of developing a worldwide way of managing global warming which of course is the big role of the dice that's happening at the moment. Right? If that destruction occurs, um, if governments and companies and so on, peoples keep wanting to extract as much money as they can from where they are in the world now before the whole thing goes down the drain totally and therefore makes the shared system such as these ones uh, totally fragile. Uh, if that's the case, then then you'll be right. The, um, uh, nothing will change. But we don't actually. What I'm trying to. We don't <laughs> actually expect all of this to change regularly because of some social change or because of some periodic change external to it. It'll keep evolving and developing. Now, to go to your specific point, um, there are different kinds of 
uh, social and if you like racial tensions operating uh, in different countries. Now, I just gave the example of Australia, where we're fortunate to have the the art and the culture of Indigenous people who, who operate an extraordinary co corrective, if you like, on the on the culture of the colonizers and um, the extractive culture of this country. Uh, again, it's complex because in some places, the local indigenous people and the mining companies get together and they exploit like crazy. In other places, it, it um, is very different and accommodations are made of a different kind. So we have, we have uh, th things of that kind. We have people in custody dying, Aboriginal people in custody dying in huge numbers. Uh, disproportionate numbers. So we have some of those same uh, questions as well. We don't, however, have something approximating a, at least a, cult, a civil war on the level of culture that's occurring in the United States. It's heading, heading, you know, to my and everyone's, I'm sure, around on this podcast dismay. Um, the implosions of government federally and on many in many states and division of the country in a partisan fashion playing out in who gets vaccinated i mean un ridiculous stuff unbelievable things occurring um leaving uh, open massive invitations for more viruses to appear all, all those things and within that um the um you know, as many, many, uh, many black writers have said, the, it's, <laughs> what COVID exposed white people to is no news to many African American uh, people in terms of daily life and so on and so forth. But what some, I think, some very productive, and I mean, I've noticed very positive things come out of that. Um, in universities, including ours at Pitt. I'm glad to say my replacement will be an African American or a, a will be a professor of African or African-American diaspora, um, African-British art studies. That person will replace me when I retire in, uh, within the coming year. At the, at the museum, Carnegie Museum, where I'm a board member, uh, we've made significant appointments over the past couple of years and significant changes in the programming. Uh, Developed practices of outreach where no teenager has to pay to enter the museum, for example. Um, the uh, Carnegie International a few years ago, there was an artwork which made available in the, in the Carnegie Library in Braddock, which is a, really a black, very poor suburb, artworks by artists from the international, in, famous international. You could borrow, local school kids could borrow artworks by you know, Anne Hamilton, all sorts of very you know, fantastic artists. You know. So. There, uh, there are um, multitudes of small steps going on within this um, system. It, it may, you can look at it and say, oh, it's just going to be a temporary change and in a few years' time there'll be something else, you know, whatever, whatever. It'll be like what happened in terms of feminism in the art world. About five years ago, we almost reached a 50-50 uh, level, you know, as more O'Reilly told us, 50-50 displays of art by male and female artists in most US museums and galleries, slowly creeping back, going down again. You know. So that could be the case, you know. Um, but I'm trying to think about this in a way that does not presume that capital is the beginning and end, you know, is both the generator and the monster in this whole system. I don't believe it is. It is both those things, but there are many other you know, generators and monsters, you know, in, in indecision, political indecision, fear, cowardice. I mean, all sorts of elements operate um, and um, uh, can be equally um, debilitating or equally generative. You know, so I think the array everywhere has always been more complex than that. Anyway, I'll stop there because it's well. Maybe man. yeah. In our in our last few minutes before we jump to questions, um, let's segue into the other part of the book. Oh, speaking okay. about change, speaking sure. about political change, to talk about the open strike, just okay. to give the audience a sense of what that part of the book is about. 
Okay, and that's the whole last part of the book. Everyone is, um, in a way, uh, anticipating um, what's happened recently, and anticipated uh, also by Ruhr and Grupa, anticipated by the extraordinary um, decision by you know Utameda Bai and a few other people to nominate and convince the people at Castle that Ruhr and Grupa would be great uh, as the curators of, um, of the next documenta. And this, of course, recently, they, this is their artist, their list of artists. And as you see, virtually everybody, including Richard Bell from Australia and other, everybody here is an artist activist. And nearly everybody is a, works as part of a collective of some kind. Right? So in a way, um, what they've done is literally put together the two top parts of my diagram, move one onto the other, <laughs> um, you know, shifted all the independent art space activity, the most inventive they can find anywhere in the world and put it in the meta exhibition about contemporary art in the world. Extraordinary. I don't, who knows what will happen? It's an, it's an amazing gesture. I uh, look forward to see how it works out. Uh, in fact, it's already moving in, in terms of their um, lumbungs or meetings um, that they've got going uh, already. So, but anyway, to go on to the open strike, Again, I'll try and try and be brief. So um, I'll, I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this. The open strike um, was called in Beirut by um, a bunch of um, uh, arts organisations, and I'll just quickly summarise this or the essence of it. They called this strike um, in support of the political activity on the streets. Um, to try and deal with the fact that the, the government, um, as we know, divided into three different uh, power groups, cultural, religious uh, orientations, confessions, as they call them, um, had become incapable of governing the country. I mean, that's been true for a long while, but it's just got out of hand recently. So what's the, what's the strike? Uh, the strike that the people occupying the streets uh, are trying to do, what they're trying to do is re-envision government in, in for um, Lebanon, re-envision an entirely new governmental structure as something that everybody is involved in. Again, it's very idealistic because lots of people in the various interest groups don't want to be involved in this, but the other ones want to re-envisage it. The open strike is, is I think a brilliant thing because it suggests that instead of closing down and stopping what you're doing, withdrawing your labor, you actually keep, uh, if your organization is in fact uh, a place that is about reinvention and rethinking and reimagining the society, radical imagining as they call it, which many of these art spaces are precisely, that's their job, that's what they do. You keep the art space going with a few of the staff, everyone else gets out there and um, participates in the discussions to rethink the society. Then you go back and rotate and so on and so forth. So you turn your organization into a sort of, your institution into one that's deinstitutionalizing both itself and the society. Now that, of course, is a figure. It's a, it's a figure for practice, it's not, Oh, look, everything is suddenly wonderful because we're doing this. It's the beginning of how to deal with these issues. So I take that as a sort of, um, you know, um, and as a model. So, so central to a city. On the left is the outsides of Beirut. On the right, the explosion, which wiped out a lot of them, but they still keep going. I take the, the decolonize the Whitney project as an example of what we're talking about, reimagining uh, the museum. Um, and uh, one that was quite successful. And what I do is I'll just finish with this uh, image, and, uh, unless you want to ask another question about uh, anything else, Stephen, um, just to sort of summarize most of what I've been talking about and the kind of world picture within which I think we should think about these things. Um, right going back to the beginning of uh, when I said I was on Gadigal land. Um, these are the fundamentals we have to remember. I think these are the longer processes um, that will outlast capital, uh, Stephen. At least that's my bet. 
I may be wrong. But well, we'll see. We'll talk to each other about it in 20 years. Okay. Very nice. if we're, um, if we're still here. Yeah. So we, we do have one question, and I encourage people to um, write questions in chat. LL writes, perhaps we need some discussion about blockchain. Crypto NFT is a way of opening up opportunities for underrepresented artists all around the world, but also need for curatorship and criticism in the space. I don't know if you have any comments about that. Of course, it relates to just using the term network. Um, what do you think, Terry? Uh, I don't have any expertise or, or knowledge, um, but what I would really worry about, I worry about reducing, um, uh, reducing the relations that, um, that are crucial here to the latest form of, um, of fantasy or not. Fair. Blockchain is uh, yet another version, uh, in my eye, I understand it, as a kind of pure exchange, an effort to create a kind of pure, loose exchange value that's very similar to the way in which the top of the art market, the auction house, operates by selling off for unbelievably exaggerated sums the work of about 20 or 30 artists over and over again to the same people. Um, so, you know, there is that. I would doubt whether the blockchain operations um, are going to generate anything more valuable to the art, art practice than that. But I don't know enough about it, so I'll just stop there. Yeah, I mean, NFTs actually are quite fascinating in terms of <clears throat> new audiences, new forms of production. Um, we don't, it's too early in the game to say more, I think. But Ezra, um, you have a comment. Do you want to say it or should I just read it? You're, you're here if you want to speak up. No, okay. So he writes, interesting thought extends even further as decentralized collectives and representations come to the forefront <clears throat> with digital technology, um, which leads to discussion of where headed over next 10 to 20 years, as we just said. I mean, you know, we have a, a few more minutes, Terry. You didn't so much in the book um, address in this kind of typology or topography of the art world, um, the online piece per se. You mention it, of course, but, um, you know, and of course, what we've seen in the last year and a half during COVID is that so many institutions had no choice but to go online. You, in a, in a sense, you begin the book by saying how the Louvre was overwhelmed and its strategy to cut back. And then COVID came, audiences dropped by 77%, I think was your figure. Um, but everyone went online instead. So any thoughts about that? Oh, yeah. Um, I think this is really crucial. It was, going, it was happening before COVID. Um, and um, I think there are major innovations um, in the nature of not just museums, but all of these spaces uh, occurring um, in terms of the um, becoming as we're becoming digital. Um, now, but the absolute pivotal thing uh, about this is that there was a kind of expectation that um, going digital would transform everything. Right, would in fact generate um, changes in the specific nature of artworks uh, in every relation that was operating uh, and so on and so forth. So that um, um, what that often did was mistake uh, the, the means for an end and a, um, a communicative form for uh, a message or a content or and an effect right um so there's some of that is in fact occurring i think there's some um, uh in the way in which say museum education works um there's a much greater concentration on um stories the idea of stories that can be um as it were packaged in terms of the smaller attention span of people who are um, 
reading across um, websites at a different speed, a faster speed. So in other, in other words, the whole series of ways of um, learning what online presence is for what is normally a, a brick and mortar institution. And, you know, the Met, for example, is a classic case where they appointed a vast number of people and then they had to sack them all and then they brought them back in again and so on. So, um, but uh, many of the, uh, many of the um, more, um, the uh, independent art spaces operate to a degree digitally as well. But in a way it goes back in a way to answer to the same question that you, you asked. Um, uh, my answer to your general question about capital. Um, the, what's happening is we've got a, um, a different way of distributing the same <gasps> stuff. It is, it's Robert. What's going on? Oh, because it's Jerry Smith. Is Henry on this too? Who's speaking? Go ahead. Who was that? <laughs> we had it. Someone made a mistake in having their mute oh, okay. off. <laughs> had their mute off. Okay. So I think um, uh, digital is, uh, as many people in, deeply involved in it say, uh, a fantastic tool. It opens up possibilities of, of connection uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, it, I don't, it's just slowly changing aspects of what we're talking about. Uh, but I, I definitely um, shifting to a digital platform does not in and of itself <laughs> generate either better or newer or fundamentally different kind of content. I haven't seen that occur uh, yet. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, Charles, let's end with a, a question from Charles Green. Charles, I see you're there. Do you wanna just unmute yourself and, and ask it? Okay, hi, Terry. I wanna, given the likely ongoing travel restrictions and the recurrent lockdowns that we see, don't we already see a diminution of the status of global biennales as sites and as disseminators? Won't that impact massively on the affective capacity of groups like Run Grouper working through Documenta? Uh, it's not really a debate. I'm more interested in your observations. Mm. And of course, China and the enormous uh, gaps appearing, except in terms of the global art market between um, China's infrastructure and Western art infrastructures. So it's really a one part question. It's to do with the, the diminution of the affect of Biennales in terms of activism. Right. I think um, it's, it's important to bring it up. I think, Charles, it, it's, it had been happening before um, COVID. Um, I, you know, I think um, the, the proliferation of Biennales starting in the 90s, as, as you and Anthony in your book uh, covered so well, um, you, you were at the point where you ended the book, if I remember, basically saying that Biennales were, were in this kind of contradiction, this double, which you found energizing, like I do, uh, between um, having on the one hand to serve uh, local capital, local tourist interests and, you know, uh, the cities that they're in and so on and so forth, uh, but also um, be vehicles for a kind of uh, radical critique and critical practices and imagining futures differently and so on and so forth, which I've identified as fundamental energies of the uh, of our, uh, our practice per se. That sort of, so you already identified that as, as a contradiction. Now, as um, biennials became more and more institutionalized, more and more tied to city governments, including and particularly in China, right, before COVID, um, uh, and throughout Asia, the sort of, the, the, that process uh, was occurring. Another in fact, so many biennials um, demanding of the curators that every single one of them be a, reconceived the biennial structure as such. 
too much for well even the best uh, Geraldo Mascara in uh, uh, in Ghent you know wonderful reinventions of, but you know you just can't keep doing it um, so in a way biennials were already becoming victims of their own success in a certain way and then, then everything then got labeled a biennial like you know uh, artwork shown at a wine festival in a, in a Victorian country town or something, you know, so uh, so all that had been happening. And then you're right, so COVID sort of put all that in a hole and sort of block. So it, it, it does become a question um, whether the sort of, to me, the, the great value of biennials have, has been their position in kind of transition between all the other things. I'll just if I may, Stephen, quickly show you one more diagram <laughs> before we yeah. wrap up. Um, when I did that other diagram, it suddenly occurred to me, because I was just reading um, Benjamin's essay on uh, uh, exhibitionary value, of course, one's always rereading that essay. But it struck me that within this whole cluster, this is a whole cluster to generate exhibitionary value. I mean, the whole complex generates as opposed to cult value, the religious value, or you know, just pure material value, it actually needs to create, has to attract people, uh, has to create points of attraction, po points of exhibition, the energy, um, and uh, but the system or the whole ecology, the whole complex, uh, does so by focusing on different kinds of value, representing it and making it continue and varying it and renovating it and so on. Uh, I just wrote this down yesterday, so it's just totally raw um, in terms of the different kinds of values that I see within the museum cluster, the market structure, biennial structure, independent art space structures, the public domains. Um, you know, don't quote me on any of this, folks, but um, the value that biennials had, um, I think the reason why they came up, um, the fundamental global reason why they uh, became so prominent was of course, not they weren't caused by globalization <laughs> as such, they were a response to the economic and social cultural conditions of globalization from the art world to generate a form that um, could be a kind of plane of transition. Right? between museums, markets, independent art spaces and general publics, right? That would only, as I said, occur for certain amounts of time and not be locked in as, um, as a repeating institution, of course. Many of them, like Sydney, you know, have been going 30, 40 years, so they do become middle-aged, mature places and that gradually loses its power. Anyway, transition value and connecting different parts of the world, that's in and of itself a value. So, Here's Walter Benjamin elaborated a little bit in terms of values for you. So you precipitated that diagram, Charles. Thank you <laughs> for that. Okay. So I think we've come to an end. Um, Terry, thank you so much. Thanks for writing the essay. Thanks for this evening. Um, the book is out there for everyone. Sternberg Press has published it. It's um, part of MIT presses catalogs, you can get it there. <clears throat> so, Terry, have a good day to everyone. Have a good evening or day wherever you are. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody.